Well, uh, first of all, if you're a, a visitor or uh, someone new to us, uh, I will use a term today uh, called a Gentile, just in case, I, so I don't have to explain that as I go along. That means a non-Jew, like you, <laughs> I think, but um, essentially a non-Jew, a Gentile's non-Jew. I'll also, just as a bit of a health warning, I will touch upon a, a subject that we, we don't often talk about on a Sunday, a little sensitive, just in case you're sensitive. I've got your attention now. <laughs> You know we're doing a short season on um, Advent, and Paul start, kicked that off last week, um, and uh, I'm doing this one. Uh, and you know um, that Advent always starts on about the 1st of September, when the Christmas cards hit the shops, and you think, oh my goodness, Christmas is on the way. And it generally finishes about the 1st of April when the Easter egg turns up <laughs> in that same supermarket. But actually, within the church calendar, it's the four Sundays running up to Christmas Day. And it's to prepare us for, for that time of celebration of Jesus' birth. Does it matter we're doing only two rather than four? No. Does it say in the Bible that we should celebrate Advent? No. Will it make us in a better standing before God if we do it? No. But will it be a good reminder of what the season is truly about? Well, yes. And that's its main benefit to us, that we can prepare for the arrival of the day we celebrate the birth of Christ, the saviour of the world. But you know what this preparation is, don't you? You know what to expect already. There'll be concerts. <laughs> It's become a tradition, you realize. This is dangerous. We've had more than two. There'll be parties and tinsel and trees and turkey and pigs in blankets, or vegan options available, no doubt. <laughs> and presents and nativity plays and the queen, and we all love it. As well as some overeating, some arguing, bickering, bit of disappointment, exhaustion for some, possibly some debt and a bit of sadness along the way, plus some lousy TV films. You know what to expect in this preparation. It's very similar to last year. And you also know the story that we're celebrating. You know, it's only in a couple of chapters within just two of the books of the Bible in Matthew and Luke. It's quite short, and we know it. It's, it's, ooh, we've been brought up on it, most of us. All about the baby and the arrival of wise men and the trip to Bethlehem and the bad bits. And we know the story. We know what to expect. But for one person in this story, the arrival of Christ is particularly unexpected. It's perhaps not the one you might expect. I'm going to read from Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken in by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name 
he called his name Jesus. Can you just imagine Joseph's plight? That's just a few verses. He's one person who absolutely knows that this child is not his. That's devastating in that culture. And I just touch upon two, two verses. Verse 18 says, before they came together. Verse 25, knew her not. We know what they're talking about, don't we? Other versions use consummate. Had no union. I even looked at the modern translation in the message. And he says, came to the marriage bed. Come on, Eugene. Say it as it is. We all know what it is. They made love. <laughs> I'm a child of the 50s and 60s. Such a lot of you are as well, and you weren't shocked by that term. <laughs> I don't know where the term had sex appeared in the time how it became part of our standard vocabulary in, in where, where I grew up and that was on a farm we knew all that went on it was we made love and I still like that term so much better because it embodies so much more of not only the physical sensual pleasure but also the emotional the feelings behind it what goes on here as well as anywhere else? And also, that spiritual mystery of the coming together of a man and a woman in marriage, in union, that has spiritual mystery like as Jesus, the, the groom, and the church as the bride. But whatever we call it, they hadn't done it. <laughs> and they're making absolutely sure that we know it. And it's a big deal in that culture. A big deal. An unmarried mother and a deceived husband. Massive stigmas. You see, dating and, and marriage, um, if you're not familiar with this, is very different in New Testament times than it is now. And so the parents of a daughter who's ready to bear a child, so that's between 14 and 16, would look around for a suitable husband, and then the families would get together, have discussions, come to a contract, money would pass, often, and it would be in front of witnesses, a betrothal. Now that's a lot more than an engagement. That could only be broken by a divorce. And, and following on from this betrothal, Although it doesn't say this was happening to Mary, what was common in the culture was that Mary would go to live in the household of Joseph's parents. While he, for up to a year, went about organizing where they were going to live, which was quite often building another room, another series of rooms, onto the house of his father. You can just sort of get a sense of the crisis here that's going on in the minds of the people around with this situation. The whole situation is awful, shameful. In verse 19, it says, he is a just man. That generally means he obeys the law. Do you know if he obeys the law, someone could get stoned? And I don't mean high. I mean, they can literally get stoned because that's what it says in Deuteronomy 22, 23. Mary, and whoever, whoever she has been unfaithful with. There's a little irony in that somewhere. And he will know his history. Joseph will know his history. In the 17 verses before the one we read, the right at the beginning of Matthew, there's a whole genealogy of how Joseph got to be where he is and how Jesus uh, fits into that. There are 42 generations of them, and there's some unexpected people in it, including three grandmothers with very dubious sexual histories. 
I suspect he would know all this. This is the sort of thing they record. How could this happen to me in the family line? It's not how it was supposed to be. It's not how the contract is supposed to work. It's not how it's planned. Well, the first thought he has, it's in verse 19, is perhaps slightly unexpected, graceful. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her sh to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. <sighs> he will just do it quietly. Quietly means that in front of two witnesses, he will then divorce her. And they'll just hopefully sweep it away. And his reputation is not sullied because she is still showing and is pregnant. And he works out, he has these two choices. And he chooses, in his mind, to do the right thing. The right thing, which is not to cause downfall for Mary. Not to cause such an absolute hoo-ha about it. But it's not over, really. In verse 20, it's as he considered it, so it's still going on. And that... That word for considered is very much um, it's an English translation that comes to considered. The root of the word for considered in the Bible actually has two branches. One, yes, is considered and pondered. And another root is perplexed and very upset. And it's used elsewhere in the New Testament to describe how Herod felt when the Magi sort of didn't keep their appointment. Or when Peter was stood on the roof and had the dream that he was to go and eat unclean food with Gentiles, there was a battle going on about this. A perplexion, an upset. And who would not expect that for Joseph? But something else unexpected was about to happen. I mean very unexpected in this story. An angel appears to him in a dream. I mean, just saying those words, an angel appears to him in a dream and tells him that Mary has not been unfaithful to him. <laughs> well, that's a good part of the news. Thank goodness for that. Where does that lead me? Well, the angel tells him of amazing things that are to happen and to things that he has to do. And crucially, to assure him to not have fear, to not be afraid in this new situation. This is a roller coaster for Joseph. I would love to hear how Mary and Joseph compared notes about angels. <laughs> I mean, do you have those sort of conversations? <laughs> now Joseph had a third option. He was going to choose the right option. Now he chose the best option, the God option. And on that day, that birthday, there would be no tinsel, no turkey, certainly no pigs in blankets. <laughs> <laughs> what Joseph still had to deal with was his wife, who was carrying someone else's child. She has a lot to do with the pregnancy. But he has no real part other than obedience, even to the point of not making love until the child was born. And so he marries her earlier, takes her into the house, and suffers whatever stigma that goes with that. God's son would be born fully human, without the passage of sin from Adam. Ah. Fully human, because he was born of Mary, but fully divine, because he did not have the passage of sin from Adam. But life didn't stop there for um, Joseph. This may just be a few chapters, but my goodness, does it get busy. A tax return arrives. Self-assessment drops onto the doorstep. 
terribly topical this time of year. I am so grateful not to have to fill very many of these in anymore. You have to go to Bethlehem for a census for tax purposes. There's no IT. We can't do it online. You have to get there. And Joseph chooses, I think we could understand why, to take Mary with him. And he goes. And, and while they're there during the whole birth process, some amazing people come from the East with totally useless presents. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like Christmas. <laughs> and unexpected guests, like hordes of shepherds. who are telling them about angel hosts. I, I and then it doesn't really even stop there, because after eight days, Jesus is circumcised as in accordance with the law, and then um, after 40 days, they go up to the temple. Because, because Jesus is the firstborn son of the family, he must be dedicated to the Lord. The firstborn son is dedicated. And it's also a time when the parents must cleanse themselves and they take a sacrifice. And they take a, a pauper's sacrifice, the lowest you can possibly take, which are a couple of pigeons. And they go up to the temple. They do the stuff. They go to church. But in the middle of it, amazing thing happened. A guy turns up and just prophesies over them. This person has been waiting for the arrival of the Saviour. His name's Simeon. Oh Lord, let, my, let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For I have seen your salvation, which has been prepared before the face of all people to be a light to the Gentiles. Yes! It's there, you and I. And to be for the glory of your people in Israel. And he's not the only one. There's a lady, a prophetess in there, who never leaves the temple. And she gives a similar story. And what does, what, 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 Joseph. This just must be amazing things that happen. Light of, to the Gentiles. Just a minute. Is that what these visitors were about? They were talking about a light. Saving my people from their sins. Isn't, isn't that what the angel was telling us about? I mean, these are wonderful confirmations for Joseph in the whole scheme of things. And then there's a couple more angelic visits. You'd think one was enough. And a trip in and out of Egypt to escape Herod's wrath. What? Just as a parent, I mean, I just can't imagine what he must have been going through to have worked through that situation. I have got to become a refugee to protect my child, but I'm jolly well going to do it because an angel of the Lord has told me to do it. And to escape one of the blackest things that sits in the book we read is the murder of innocents in and around Bethlehem that would come, trying to snuff out the birth of the, the life of the Saviour. And eventually back, into Nazareth, to the normality of a family, a carpentry business, more children, a bit of normality in his life. Other than that last one where when Jesus is 12 and they go up to the temple and uh, <laughs> happens to us all, they lost him. Um, it took a day before they realized Jesus wasn't with them. And when... <laughs> I'd talk to social services if it was me. But, <laughs> but when eventually they went back and they found him, amazing things had been happening. The scribes and the teachers were amazed at what Jesus was talking to them about. And for Joseph, the reminder, when Jesus says to him, do not be surprised to find me in my father's house. Joseph reminded that he was only ever the adoptive father. He wasn't his real father. Joseph largely dis he disappears from the story now. And other than a 
few disparaging remarks about Jesus' lineage from folk like, isn't he Joseph's son, the carpenters? We don't hear about him anymore. Paul never mentions him, and he's largely forgotten. Although the church later made him a saint, he had regular bookings in nativity plays for centuries thereafter, <laughs> plus associated merchandise that can be obtained just about anywhere. For me, he's the first New Testament hero. He's a real hero. Chosen, obedient, faithful. What can we learn from Joseph's story? Well, I'm just going to come out with three points. What God ordains happens. It's entirely expected. First of all, in the prophecy, the, the Old Testament is teeming with references, not only relating to the birth, but also to the life of Jesus and why he would come and how things would work out. But just in relation to the birth, Genesis 3.15, he would be human born of a woman. Genesis 22.18, he would be a descendant of Abraham. Isaiah 11.1, 1, descendant of Jesse, King David. Micah 5.2, he would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 7, 13 and 14, about the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, 14, he'd be called Emmanuel. I can go on. Full of them. In fact, the whole Old Testament, from creation onwards, is constantly making, within the story, references to Jesus. Uh, and I believe there's a challenge going on to find one in every chapter, or maybe even smaller bits. Um, for those of you who weren't able to go to Devoted, that's our summer camp this year, um, I do urge you to get on the website for Devoted and listen to the Sunday night talk by Andrew Wilson, who, was, who really expounded some of these places that Jesus could be found in the Old Testament. And I never thought about half of them. They are, it's fascinating. It's a really engaging talk. And... Um, I just didn't want him to stop. It is fascinating. Jesus was fully pro prophesied. The Old Testament points to it. This census fascinates me, not just because my history in tax, um, but just that God uses angels to tell Mary and Joseph absolutely crucial things you know, Joseph about this, what he must do to protect this saviour. And then how to escape. Going somewhere where you wouldn't expect him to go, but to get out, to go to Egypt. Really important things. And yet, in the whole scheme of things, he's got the whole of the known world moving to their places of birth, which fulfills a prophecy. doesn't always do what we expect. But God plans it, absolutely. And when we don't sometimes know what's going on, that's where faith kicks in. Secondly, God chooses the unexpected. Not a fully grown king to save the world, but a vulnerable baby. From something the smallest, the atom, the conception of this baby from the maker of the largest we can possibly imagine. It is mind-blowing when we think about it. A carpenter and a teenage virgin, a virgin lowly shepherds and Gentiles, non-Jews, mystical visitors. Later, Jesus would call artisans and fishermen corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes to be followers. He would mix and touch society outcasts and save a wretched criminal hanging with him on the cross. I still don't fully know why he chose me other than he must love me. But when he has chosen us, has given us a path to follow, however challenging, however difficult, Remember the word to Joseph. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. 
even though the path is difficult and the world may be going mad around us, whether it's our nation or whether it's just our personal circumstances. Jesus says, John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as, as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And the whole context of that reading, this chapter, is in the context of the coming of the Holy Spirit to the church after Jesus has gone. That same spirit that conceived Jesus was coming into the world for his church. Thirdly, we now know the outline of the plan. A bit better than Brexit, isn't it? <laughs> Got it in somewhere. It is written. The Old Testament reveals through it a whole redemption plan. The illustrations of Old Testament characters and events show us and indicate how it will happen and as the prophecies. Jesus laid it out in his ministry in sometimes such unexpected ways, but certainly the unexpected way of a sacrifice. A sacrifice of a firstborn son. Fully human, born of a woman, fully divine, conceived by the Holy Spirit, without a sinful trait. This has happened. Advent not only prepares us to celebrate the birth of Christ, but also to prepare for Jesus' second coming. I'll read you one of my favorite bits. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are still left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will arise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with our Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other, encourage each other with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them, suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Joseph and Mary had angel visitors to tell them about Jesus. Simeon knew in his heart by the Holy Spirit that this was the saviour of the world in front of him. We have the Bible that tells us this. But you know, I've really tried to get under the skin of Joseph and this whole story piece, mainly in Matthew. And I had to stop myself for one minute and say, Patrick, do you really believe this? I mean, come on. You're a chartered accountant. <laughs> you have a logic to things. Do you really believe what I've just told you all about? You've been a Christian for 40 odd years. Do you really believe it? And I have to tell you, I do. I do. I know it deep within me that I believe it. And why do I know it? Because when I became a Christian, the same Holy Spirit that conceived the baby, the same Holy Spirit that spoke to Simeon, the same Holy Spirit that would rise Christ from the dead lives in me. Yes, yeah. 
lives in you. So I can believe it. Lloyd-Jones, a famous preacher, he just calls it, it's a wonderful term, blessed assurance. And just a complete knowledge within your heart. Yes, this is true. You can tell me it's not, but it's true. I know it. I know it. I'm going to ask the band to come up. Um, Oh, thank you. Yes, prepare for Christmas. Fellowship, fun, family, food, festive praise. It is a celebration. It is a celebration. But we also need to look for, prepare for his return. If you're not a Christian today, now is a good time. Couldn't be a better time. Couldn't be a better time. Come and talk to one of us if you have some questions about what you've heard today. If you're already a Christian, well, the words we hope to hear one day are, welcome, you good and faithful servant. I am absolutely convinced that Joseph will have heard that as an obedient, faithful service. But what that means to each one of us is what God works out with us. So as we sing this song, Reach out to him in your hearts. The next to the last verse in the Bible says, Yes, I am coming soon. And we could talk a lot about that word soon. But you know what? It's sooner today than it was yesterday. 